Hello everyone, salve a tutti e bentrovati. Welcome and thank you for joining us for a special program celebrating International Women's Day. I can see many regular and many new friends online with us today. We are almost a thousand participants, so let me briefly introduce myself. I am Emanuela Mendola and I'm the director of the Italian Cultural Institute in Washington, D.C. First, let me wish a very happy International Women's Day to all the women that will be on screen in a minute. And of course, I would like to wish all the women in the audience too. The condition of women is one of the elements that attest to the degree of civilization that the country has achieved, as the President of the Italian Republic, Sergio Mattarella, said on many occasions. We have come a long way from the days in which uh, women fought for uh, rights, and uh, while much progress has been done, much more can be achieved. Congratulating the women on this day also means honoring the women who came before and paved the way. During this program, we will focus in fact on one woman in particular who paved the road for many women artists, Artemisia Gentileschi. And we will speak about Artemisia right in front of one of her most interesting works, L'Inclinazione, the Allegory of Inclination. Today's webinar is in fact quite special, not only because our speakers will be inside the Museo di Casa Buonarroti in Florence, where this painting still lives, but also because uh, we will have uh, a crew following them inside the museum as they unveil the connection between Artemisia, Michelangelo, and the other historic women artists. This is the first time that we organize uh, such a complex uh, setup for a Zoom webinar, so since uh, we are live, please be patient in the case uh, there are hiccups. But uh, as uh, my mother always uh, told me, whenever you embark on a new adventure, you should always have uh, some trusted friends by your side. And uh, I'm very happy to stick uh, to that teaching by having with me today two great friends who have been our guests in the past and it was always a joy to have back. Linda Falcone and Elizabeth Weeks from uh, Advancing Women Artists. Linda Falcone is the director of Advancing Women Artists and is the author of many books that spotlight the cast to cover Lost Art by Women from the Renaissance and Beyond. Elizabeth Weeks is a conservator of fine art with over 30 years of experience. She directs conservation projects for museums, churches, public properties, and her restoration projects range from restoring murals at the Radio City Music Hall to sculptures by Michelangelo. Advancing Women Artists is a non-profit organization founded in 2009 by American philanthropist Jane Fortune and that, as many of you might know, will close this summer. AWA was born with the goal to identify, restore and exhibit works by women artists in Florence and after more than 70 restorations and countless programs, while its closures is set for many, it is actually a sign of victory. The organization was designed to raise awareness and shine a light on little-known art treasures by women. And today they can say that their mission is accomplished and we are all very grateful for what they did. And uh, talking about uh, gratitude, today I also would like to express my most sincere ringraziamento to the president of the Museo Casa Buonarroti in Florence, Cristina Acidini. Miss Acidini is also the current president of uh, the Accademia delle Arti del Disegno of uh, Firenze, the oldest artistic academy in the world, founded in uh, 1563 by Giorgio Vasari in honor of uh, Michelangelo. In the past, she has been superintendent at the Opificio delle Pietre Dure and at the Polo Museale Fiorentino, which comprises 27 state-of-the-art museums, including the Uffizi, the Academia delle the Galleria dell'Accademia, Palazzo Pitti, and the Boboli Gardens. Today, Miss Acidini opened especially and exclusively for us, after hours, the Museo Casa Buonarroti, and uh, we are incredibly grateful for her support and hospitality. Before uh, giving the floor to our speakers, I would like to inform you that uh, we will have some time for a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please uh, type your comments or questions in the chat or in the Q&A section of your Zoom client at any time during the program, and uh, we will try to answer to as many as possible. It is uh, now my honor to give uh, the microphone to the president of Casa Bonarroti, Cristina Acidini, who will introduce us uh, into this house of uh, great beauty and art. Grazie mille. Thank you, Emanuele. I welcome you all. 
And thanks to the Italian Institute of Culture, as well to the Embassy, and thanks to the great friends of uh, AWA, AWA that, that have such a passion for the women artists' activity and for Florence. And I'm very thankful for all what they did, and I'm sure they will continue to do. It's a special privilege to host you here in the very house of the Bonarroti family, in a wing that will soon be the scene of, of, uh, of a walk with our friends, and that was entirely uh, built and decorated by the uh, grand uh, nephew of Michelangelo Buonarroti, the great uh, divine artist. Michelangelo the Younger, that worshipped the memory of his uh, uh, sibling and was absolutely uh, uh, able to transform what was a small palace into a miniature uh, mansion with the grandeur and the elegance of, of a palace. You will see it. But what I want to stress is that the house uh, uh, where Michelangelo used to live when he was in Florence, not in this shape exactly, it was a much more modest and small, but thanks to his wealth, the house was enlarged and transformed into the one that we see now that is virtually intact and it is a real shrine of arts of the 15th and, and especially 16th and 17th century. The house hosts two masterpieces by Michelangelo uh, as a young uh, trainee, so to say. He was uh, learning to draw and to sculpture, uh, sculpture under Michel um, Lorenzo il Magnifico's uh, direct interest and uh, the two young uh, men uh, masterpieces that are here are the Battle of the Centers and the Madonna della Scala and I, I hope that when we reopen the museum they will be again attractive uh, for a local and an international public. Moreover, the house is a real shrine of treasures that are not totally visible because they are kept into uh, safe conditions. They are 200 drawings by Michelangelo and uh, archival uh, documents, uh, letters, poems, and other uh, papers that belong to his history as well as to the history of the family that uh, was um, in, in activity until the uh, 19th century. At that time, the last of the Buonarroti, Cosimo, uh, presented the house and the collections to the city. It was a great act of uh, liberal generosity. And so it became a museum, an archive, a library, open partially to the public, and a sort of special place for Michelangelo's studies but also for studies generally dedicated to the family. The next exhibition that we will host will be a, about exactly Michelangelo the Younger, the one who uh, enlarged and embellished the house. And now uh, you will see the masterpieces that are all around and I hope that a large public will soon come again to visit the museum. And we are very thankful to all the friends, to all the associations, to all the visitors that want to support Casa Bonarroti. It's a great small museum that needs all the friends it can get. So thank you for being with us tonight, uh, this evening, and uh, thank you for uh, visiting virtually uh, this place that we are so proud of. Thank you, thank you Christina. Thank you, Emanuele. Thank you and welcome. We're um, actually celebrating not only Women's Day, but by having our event here at Casa Buonarroti, which is one of my favorite places in Florence, and I've been lucky enough to do some conservation work here over the years. We are celebrating also Michelangelo's 546th birthday, which was on Saturday. And uh, what better place to celebrate art than in this very room, which was built to honor Michelangelo the Younger's famous great uncle and raise him to divinity. And I'm here in the guise of conversationist and interviewer of Linda Falcone. So Linda, why don't I invite you to, to welcome our guests yes. and lead us on the way to the center of the room where we'll talk about fame. 
Well, thank you, and thank you so much. Um, I really, first of all, would like to welcome our guests um, and thank you for being here today. This is such an exciting place uh, visually, and it is dedicated, as we saw, to historical memory and to artistic inspiration. So we are going to the center, we're going to the heart of the ceiling, um, and we're going to begin looking up. If you can take a look, and I hope the cameras can, can help you um, in being able to, to see. We're looking here at fame, as fame accompanies Michelangelo um, and helps Michelangelo ascend to immortality. That's so right. Michelangelo goes beyond all of the artists that preceded him. Uh, you see fame with her trumpet, and you can see, for example, underneath their hands, you see ancient artists of the past. Uh, Apele was an ancient Greek artist. And then behind Michelangelo, you can see Donatello and Brunelleschi. So this That's is- That's right, and fame is, is leading him up higher than all of the other artists. Exactly. In this sort of amphitheater, this symbolic amphitheater. Exactly, and so the question is why? Right. right? What, what was it about Michelangelo that gave him almost divine status? And we can see it right here in the next square, in the next work. Um, we have Michelangelo Buonarroti is being crowned by the four arts. That's and right. there are three arts of design and then poetry. So, for example, the the allegory that looks like a sculptress, the one that's semi-nude, um, is the allegory of sculpture. She's holding a sculpture in her hand. I don't know if you can see that, but you can certainly see her sculptural forms. <laughs> and then we have um, poetry, and she's holding the violin. And then architecture um, with the book that represents drawing. And then, um, and then we have painting. That's right. So these are the four these are the four arts. Michelangelo was the inspiration for the Academia delle Arte del Disegno, uh, the arts of drawing, and we have his divinization here. So it's actually the only space in the world that we know of where the artist is not the one immortalizing, but the artist is the one being immortalized. That's right, it's a unique space. It is a temple to an artist. I mean, unbelievable. So we're talking about fame. Yes. We're, we're looking at paintings by her contemporaries. This one is by Sigismondo Cocapani, and this one is by Francesco Corradi, but where is the Lady of the Hour? Exactly. Where is the Lady of the Hour? Yes. Where is Artemisia? Can we go see her? Yes, she's the, she's the lady we've all been waiting for. I'm just going to take you a couple steps down this way. And here we have the allegory of the inclination that Emanuela was mentioning before, this very special painting um, that is self-portrait of sorts of Artemisia Gentileschi. Right, this is a canvas. There, all the paintings on the ceiling are canvases. So we know that Artemisia painted this painting when she was five months pregnant. She wasn't actually painting pregnant up on the ceiling, but this was the first painting that was commissioned in this room. And there was a very special relationship between her and her patron, Michelangelo the Younger. So you might want to tell us about that. Sure. Um, he was actually very fond of Artemisia and he ended up paying her three times as much as he paid the other artists. Um, the artists wow. on the ceiling were all emerging artists. They were up and coming uh, painters and Artemisia was as well. But the difference was she was paid as a master painter. Um, but I don't think it's just by chance that he commissioned Artemisia to paint the inclination, this specific theme. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about the theme of inclination? Uh, inclination is the the is artistic drive. It's talent. Um, it's the inclination to produce art. So you have Artemisia, and you can imagine that women at this time were not considered capable of large scale, grand works of art. 
And the fact that, our, that Michelangelo the Younger asked her to, to produce this specific work of art was almost a message to the world. That's right, it was highly significant. Really, yeah. really. And, and actually, that sort of concept of women not being able to produce great art continued until the, 19, the 1900s. And oh, yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. And okay, we can today, have a discussion about that. We but. can, we can. <laughs> but I always, I always think of, um, I always think actually of, of a quote by Mussolini, um, because in 1925 he, um, in, during a speech to the to the deputies, the Chamber of Deputies of the Italian uh, Congress, let's say Parliament, he said that women didn't have the power for synthesis, and they didn't have the ability. They were excluded from the creation of spiritual, great spiritual works. Wow. Um, so the fact that Michelangelo the Younger asked her to paint an, an inclination was a game changer. And it's something that we can go back to. It was a game changer, not just for her, but for all women artists. Yes. Right. Yes. And so this figure, um, I've read that this figure was originally painted in the nude. Can you yes. tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, that's, that's another element to think about because on the one hand, women were excluded um, until the 1900s, were excluded from the study of anatomy. So the fact that Artemisia is painting a complete nude. And it's the only complete nude in this room. Exactly, exactly. Because Michelangelo the Younger was said to have micromanaged all the other works, all the other symbols. He conceived and designed each painting, but in her case, he left her completely free. And we, to... know, we know all this because in the, there's everything in the archives. It's unbelievable how much stuff there is here. Yes. Drawings, preparatory sketches, letters. Yes. He was quite a scholar. He was, yeah. he was really a, an enlightened mind. Yes. Um, and, and so, on the one hand, by a descendant of Michelangelo the Younger called Leonardo Bonarotti, uh, Leonardo Bonarotti decided to put the draping over the inclination and um, because he wanted to protect the modesty and the decorum <laughs> of his wife and children. And there's a wonderful poem by Robert Browning that references Artemisia and references this work and um, it says that the blockhead, right, <laughs> the blockhead bade folk drape the nude and stop the scandal. Oh, wonderful. So it's this wonderful play on words, um, this dialogue between painting and, and uh, poetry that we can think about. And um, you told me once that when AWA wasn't even in existence, there was some thought of removing the drapery. Do you want to tell us sure. about that? Um, actually, one of the first projects that Advancing Women Artists considered doing um, with the late director of Casa Bonarotti, who was Pina Ragionieri, we had started a discussion with her on restoring this artwork by removing the drapery. Uh -huh. So bringing her back to her original splendor. And it actually was then decided that because um, the, the drapery was, was put on the allegory in the 1680s. Okay, by so Il Volterrano, right. By Il Volterrano. Who's a well-known artist. Exactly. And, and Artemisia obviously wasn't the only one who was centered in this, censored That's in right. this way. In fact. <laughs> Michelangelo, and in his Sistine Chapel, you'll remember that at least 40 figures um, were, were censored by another artist, always from Volterra, Daniele, That's right. Daniele di Volterra. No? A specialty um, of artists from Volterra to, to cover up exactly. nudity. Cover up nudity, exactly. So um, we had thought for a moment that with Pina Ragionieri we would do this, this work and then she decided against it because of its, it mm -hmm. represents a historical moment. Well, I mean, it's part of the history of the piece. It was by a famous artist. <coughs> it's quite old and so we really can't uncover it. I mean, we just can't do that in restoration. But one thing that we can do with modern technology, and I think it would be a fantastic thing if we could do it, <laughs> is study this painting, get it down from the ceiling, and with modern diagnostic techniques, read beneath that drapery and see the original form of Artemisia, both as a painter and, and uh, as a subject. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the subject of inclination? <coughs> well, there are certain there are certain um, 
connections that we can make. For example, she has her compass, mm -hmm. and her compass is a nod to Galileo. Um, they were all friends, Michelangelo the Younger, Galileo, and Artemisia, and they all met in these rooms. Um, they had their social gatherings, and um, so she, in some way, was supporting his discussion of magnetism, for example. Right, and, and the, all the scientific discoveries that were happening in this period of enlightenment. Yeah, yeah. There's something, though, that's interesting, and, and, and if you look at yeah. her, her posture, do you want to tell yeah. us? Yeah, okay, so, so in this room, originally, one of the, the centerpieces of the room was a, the first uh, work that was done by young Michelangelo, the sculptor, when he was in his teens, and it was placed in this room at the end of the room. It was actually walled into the end of this room, and it's now been moved to a, a more proper museum setting, and there's a figure in that bas-relief that is very similar to the pose that Artemisia's uh, inclination has holding up her compass. And so we think it might, scholars have thought it might be a nod to a connection that she's making with her piece and Michelangelo's sculpture. So why don't we go see that sculpture, yes. which is in the next room? You want me to? Um, why don't you lead the yeah, way? Sure. sorry. Okay. Christina. Entriamo qua. So arriviamo qui. Entriamo qua. Okay. Okay. So the figure that I was talking about is this one on um, this end here where he is holding a rock, which he is okay, about I just, to... I just think one second. Let me interrupt you. Yes. Yeah. I think our camera, oh, okay. our camera people got enthralled <laughs> by the gallery, right? Sorry. They're, the poor things are in the gallery. So here we are. So and here we are. Here's, here's the, young, the young Michelangelo. He did this in his teens, and uh, it's his very first work. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about it, but I wanted to just make that connection with Artemisia. This figure is thought to have influenced her. Um, he is holding a rock that he is about to launch into the battle of this, you know, very it, it, sort of a snake's nest of centaurs and lapiths, the the fight between reason and chaos. Yes, yes. There's another figure here as well that's also a nod to another of Miguel later work, works, right? Later work, which is. Um, the Christ, the triumphant Christ, at, during the Last Judgment at the Sistine Chapel with the raised hand. Um, but what's interesting, going back to the inclination idea, is that Michelangelo always felt a really serious inclination towards sculpture. And this was an early piece. This had been a Casa Buonarroti, basically was, from day one, right, really. Since well, day since one. Lorenzo the Magnificent died, and it was moved from the garden, so Michelangelo couldn't work on it any longer. And it ended up at Casa Buonarroti, where he kept returning to it. Every time he came back to Florence, he would take out this sculpture and he'd look at it and maybe he'd chisel on it a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, um, but, but he said that he felt that he had done a wrong turn to nature by getting distracted by other forms of art because he felt that just judging from what he was able to accomplish as a young artist in the Medici Garden at San Marco, what he would have not been able to accomplish as a sculptor had he really, you know, only had a one-track mind for sculpture. Right, and, and all I can say to that is thank God he didn't because we wouldn't have gotten the Sistine Ceiling, the Last Judgment, St. Peter's, mm -hmm. and so many other things that the man was able to do. But um, it is, it's, it's just, a, it's a really amazing piece. And it also points out his love of sculpture. He said at one point later in life that sculpture for him compared to painting was like uh, the sun compared to the moon. He, he, de he definitely preferred sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, he, was, he almost felt it was like an act of creation. It was like... That's right, that's right. Taking Adam out of the stone. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And you really see that here. I mean, it's almost a pre-manuristic piece. It's, it's so um, here, for fraught with life. Mm -hmm. It's really quite interesting. And uh, as you see, parts of the work are finished and parts of the work have been left very unfinished. This work is undergoing restoration at the moment. Mm -hmm. This It's being restored by the Friends of Florence, which is 
uh, one of our friend institutions, definitely. Uh, they're, they're responsible for restoring so many important works of art here in Florence. So just a shout out yes. uh, to Friends of Florence for this wonderful project that they're just beginning. That's no? right. Yep. yep. Okay. okay. So now let's go back and see some more paintings. Yes. Let's leave the sun and go back to the moon. <laughs> Okay, now we're back in the gallery and we're going to show you the twin piece to Artemisia's inclination, which is this work by Francesco Bianco uh, Vita. Bonavita and it was done in 1616 as well. And its title, its attribute, it's the attribute of Ingenio. So can you tell us a little bit about what Ingenio is? Yes, Ingenio comes from Genio, which is genius. And so it is the intelligence that one needs to create art. So you can't only have the inclination, you also need to have the know-how. Um, this particular figure, this particular allegory is a Mercury-like figure, and you can see his wings on his helmet. And we'll remember that Mercury is the god of eloquence, of intelligence, astuteness, dextricity, athletism. Uh, there are so many different attributes that he attributes has. Attributes yeah. that he has. And, and I would suggest even that, that Artemisia has a lot of these Absolutely. Different, um, <laughs> different qualities. Because, because something that our guests should, should think about is that a lot of, particularly the monochromes, which we'll see soon, um, are virtues. So the virtue, they represent the virtues of Michelangelo. Uh, so our question to our guest is, what are the virtues of Artemisia? Because they're probably not the same. No, they're not the same. And I, and I think some of them like moderation, even prudence, modesty. Christian, uh, Christian piety. Christian piety, yes. There are several attributes and virtues that might not apply, but why, why don't you come up, we're gonna come up with an ideal temple to Artemisia. So come up with some virtues and attributes for her, please, while you're yes. listening to us. And one of the things that I wanna make a connection between Ingenio and the next painting we're going to see is when you talked about commerce, mm -hmm. because, um, and, and cleverness really, because both Michelangelo, obviously with, with the great patrons that he had, but also Artemisia, were very involved in court life, in the political life of Florence and, and um, also abroad. Yes. And Artemisia got her first start at the court of the Medici through really the auspices also of, of Michelangelo the Younger. Yes. So let's turn and see this painting over here, which is Michelangelo. This was painted by um, Cosimo Gamberucci in 1616, 1617. And it shows us the older Michelangelo in a moment which was actually a documented moment with the young Medici prince Francesco, who was the oldest son of the Grand Duke Cosimo, and was a very interesting character in his own right later on. But here he's very young, he's 20 years old, and he's in Rome, and Michelangelo is in Rome working on the Last Judgment, and he goes to pay court to the Medici prince. But the Medici prince gets up from his throne and says, no, here, you sit in my throne, you sit in my place. And this was, I mean, an incredible thing for a grand duke, well, he's about to be a grand duke, to give his seat mm -hmm. to Michelangelo. So incredible that they decided to make a painting. So here we have Michelangelo in with the Medici. Yes. And I'm, I'm tying this in now to Artemisia yes. and uh, her relationship to the Medici's later Medici's. Yes, I mean, I think, I think it's interesting how, well, particularly in the Medici context, how the Medici were so fundamental in creating the artist. They, would ma they made Michelangelo, they made Artemisia because Artemisia, although she had a lot of experience with the, well, some experience with the Caravaggesque school and attitude. Through her, her own, father, right? Through her father. She became a courtly artist in Florence. That's right. And so she 
she worked in six courts in Italy and in London throughout the course of her career, but Florence was the first. Mm -hmm. And something to take into consideration is that she came here, she knew how to read, but she didn't know how to write. Wow. And she learned, it was essentially, she, she learned her education, she received her education in Florence in rooms like this one. Because she had a painting education, but she also had a very controlling father, and she, she, she didn't get, you know, schooling outside of, of uh, the schooling and painting that she had in Rome. Right, and suddenly she finds herself at the Academia That's delle right. Arti del Disegno with Galileo, with one of the greatest minds of all time, with Michelangelo and the Younger. And she was able to keep up. That's, she was. you know, it's an amazing thing about her. Yes, and it goes back to Ingenio. That's right. Um, but, but certainly, and also with the Medici, she was a, she was a fixture in society. She participated in their, in their carnival. Um, she was a trendsetter. And, the, and their, they had musical events, yes. right? There was, had... there was a musician. Mm -hmm. um, Frances Francesco Caccini. Yes, uh -huh. yes. And she, um, she put to music all of the theater works of Michelangelo the Younger, and they were great friends, and she created a role for Artemisia in some of the festivities. These were the worldly events, the carnival events. Right, so events. This, this whole cultural circle that, that uh, surrounded the Medici court and also people like Michelangelo the Younger. Yes, because it was a place and of music. Where many of you are in your lunch hour, and <laughs> you're in your lunch hour in the place to be, right, in the 1600s. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, um, going back to Michelangelo again, we're always returning back to the divine man himself. We wanted to show you briefly this painting of Michelangelo inspired by poetry, which is very dark, so we're not going to talk about it too long, but we wanted to make a point about literacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just so you can, and I hope you can see this, but you have Michelangelo here at his desk, and you have poetry, the allegory of poetry, um, up above who is inspiring him with her violin. With her, with her music. With her music. Uh, the point about literacy that, that I think is important for our guests to, to, to talk about and think about is that for women artists in particular, um, literacy was, was very important because a lot of times before they had access to the studio, they had access to the salons. And this was even later in further centuries. So if you take, for example, an Angelica Kaufman mm -hmm. or you take a um, Louisa Grace Spartolini, for example, they really, they were poets before they were artists and they would be educated as ladies in waiting, for example. So this is actually a really um, Good interesting analogy. connection. Yeah, uh -huh. very important. Leonardo da Vinci, for example, could call himself a man without letters, um, but in reality, you know, women didn't. They had women to be. couldn't say that. They had they had yeah. to be skilled in all the arts. Yeah. And but the point of this painting here was really that Michelangelo the Younger was trying to elevate the status if it needed elevating, of his great uncle by saying that he was also a poet. It was a more literary art, and it was considered a higher art than, than painting. It was on a different level. So um, in a way, they, they, they do have that parallel. Yeah, and, and the reason for that is because until the Academia dell'Arte del Disegno was established, painters were artisans. That's right. And it was established by Giorgio Vasari and Cosimo the Great in Michelangelo's name. Yes. So it, it's, and then Artemisia was the first woman admitted. So it's, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. And speaking of connections, we're going to go over here behind our cameraman. We're going to talk about this painting, another of the larger paintings on the wall. Um, because it's all about contacts and connections in this room. And Michelangelo the Younger, a wonderful thing that he did was that he put portraits of himself and his contemporaries in a lot of the paintings that are actually talking about events that were at least 100 years earlier. So here we have Michelangelo is the figure in the middle. And he is showing the model, the plans and the model for the Church of San Lorenzo, the Laurentian Library, and the new sacristy in Florence to Pope Leo X, who was the youngest son of Lorenzo the Magnificent. So it's all sort of come for a circle. Lorenzo the Magnificent 
had uh, Michelangelo be taught sculpting in the gardens of San Marco, and here his son is the Pope. And then behind him, there's another uh, Medici who is a cardinal who will become Pope Clement VII. So we're, you know, we're full of popes here. And another nice parallel that we have with the, the house of Casa Buonarroti is that that wooden model, which represents the Church of San Lorenzo, is conserved here at Casa Buonarroti, as are the plans. So you can see it all at Casa Buonarroti. Yeah. We're waiting for people to come back. Yeah, we're waiting for you to come back. <laughs> so what do we have down here? What are these little paintings, these little monochrome paintings about? This is a favorite of yours, Linda. Yes, yes, this is one of my favorites. I, I really love the monochrome works. We're gonna be looking at two with you tonight. Um, this is actually Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, um, who, when Michelangelo came into the room, he stood up. So this was you know, very similar to the painting that we saw with Francisco I um, in the corner, but this idea that, um, well, what he said or what he is quoted as saying in the legend is there are many emperors and there are many kings, but there is only one Michelangelo. Okay. And I, that, that's particularly- I can, I can see Artemisia saying that about herself. So we, we can think about putting one of those attributes in, in her temple too. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, Artemisia, didn't achieve divinization. No, um, not yet. But she, not yet. <laughs> She's not on yet. her way. Exactly. We have to see if we can do something about that. Yeah. Um, but she did say to a nobleman in, in her writing, you know, the spirit of Caesar in the soul of a woman. That's absolutely right. And she did. And if you think of the, C the Caesar and it represented a it was a representation of divinity on earth. Of course. Uh, she's really making a statement for herself and, and, and the self-portrait that she put in the inclination was also really relevant because she is She's an angelic figure. Of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, shall we go over here and look at another one of yes. our favorite reliefs? These are all by the artist Francesco Furrini and they were done after the other large paintings were finished. So these date from about 1627 to 1628. And they are actually oil on wall, which is a very interesting technique not seen in many places. Yeah. And I'm hoping, so, I'm hoping the camera can get to some nice detail here. I think the camera's getting in pretty close. Can okay. you get into the corner to the Sinista la? Yeah. Okay. So what are we seeing? We're seeing Michelangelo. Um, the, the title of this work is Michelangelo the, Michelangelo the Magnificent. And we're seeing in one case that he's refusing money offered to him by a cardinal. Um, so he's not corrupted by finances. He looks like he's pushing away a plate of pasta, actually. <laughs> well, that wouldn't be happening, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Michelangelo giving money for women's dowries. Okay, and this is, this, on some level we can link this to Artemisia. Of we course. know that she was not magnificent in this sense. She was No, she very, was constantly in need of money. Yes. She was always running out of money. Yeah. She was always in debt. She was always writing to all of her noble connections, um, asking for the dowry of her daughter, Palmira, um, asking for solutions. In fact, there's a, there's a wonderful story um, by a scholar Cavazzini who, who talks about Artemisia leaving Florence, basically fleeing from on the Florence run. Uh, on the run because of her economic debt. And she didn't finish works that she had been paid for by Cosimo II. The second, that she, and, and that was akin to thievery. So almost like a thief in the night. And it's said that she didn't hurt herself on on her horse because she fears nothing. <laughs> so it, it, it's quite not even Cosimo, not, not even, even Grand exactly, Duke Cosimo, not even the Grand Duke, who wow. who was actually very supportive of her. Uh -huh. uh, but that was a a, a moment, a um, moment of misunderstanding. Yeah, yeah, a moment of of debt. Um, okay. Okay, well, we'll move on from popes uh, <laughs> to this last little painting that we want to show you over here in the corner. 
which is, which represents a very significant event that happened just before Michelangelo was born because it shows the, um, an accident that happened to his mother. Do you want to, you want to tell us about that, Linda? She's, she's fine. Can you, can you, um, yeah, I don't know if the cameras, can you, no, we're good? Okay. Yeah, the lighting is not perfect in this little corner of the world, but um, hopefully you can see it. It's, it's his mother falling from horseback um, when she was pregnant with, I think six months pregnant, yes. with Michelangelo. And there is this idea that she was unharmed, the baby was unharmed, and this became a popular story, particularly in the 1700s. So they think that it wasn't contemporary, actually, to Michelangelo, but it contributed to his myth. It, it may not have happened, but it, but it helped the legend along. And we see, you can't probably see it, but in the top of the tiny little painting that is the, as, high as, as wide as my hand, you see Archangel Michael rushing in to save the mother and then Mr. Buonarotti over here on his horse, he's arriving a little bit too late. Yes. But nothing happened. He, Michelangelo he's was born. arriving later than the angel. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. So this is, you know, all The about miraculous him. birth. So yeah. it, helps, it helps that whole process of uh, divinization. Right. And, and predestination as and well. And predestination, uh, right. Today we have sort of a different view of artists. You know, we, they have a status that was different than, than what we would have seen at this time. So all of these mythological elements were very important in establishing Absolutely. the divine, the divine Michelangelo. That's right. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to take you on a little visit to the rest of this Baroque wing of Casa Buonarroti and see the other rooms that Michelangelo the Younger designed and talk more about Artemisia. Yes. So I'll lead the way here mm -hmm. through this narrow door. And this is what a museum looks like after hours if you have always had the dream. Yeah. Of so just, just think of Artemisia and Galileo and all of Michelangelo the Younger's friends in here listening to music and conversing and talking mm -hmm. about art and poetry. And we wanted to show you um, here, we wanted to show you the portrait of Michelangelo the Younger. It's a beautiful portrait by Cristofano Allori, who was a very good friend both of his subject, uh, Michelangelo the Younger, and also of Artemisia, and unfortunately passed away before he was able to finish one of the paintings that we uh, saw, Poetry, which he had done the cartoon, the preparatory drawing for. And then the rest of this room is a series of beautiful frescoes, including the ceiling where Jacopo Vignali painted sort of real referencing here of the Sistine ceiling. He painted God the Father separating day from night. So that has given the name of the room to the room, which is the, the, night and, the chamber of night and day. And then, Linda, why don't you show us this wonderful yeah. little jewel we have we, over here? We're really excited to show you this little um, studiolo, this little desk, scritoio. Or, right, the like, little study room. It's tiny. Little study room. And Michelangelo the Younger, who we just saw, whose portrait we just saw, was a collector, and he collected many different artifacts and coins, trinkets and coins, yep. etc. So this is his... Um, just an example. This is a beautiful pottery collection, right? right? Yeah. And then over here in this en entrance here inside, if you can just bring the camera inside, Francesco, we can show them the tiny little desk area where Michelangelo the Younger would come to study. And he was known to spend a lot of time here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe with the doors closed, smoking cigars, we don't know, but... The you'll doors actually, themselves are beautifully carved, aren't they? They're wonderful. It's, but you'll see what he was doing. We're going to go into in two rooms from here. You'll see right. especially what he was doing in his study. Um, you might want to just get a generalized view of the room. I think that um, they did. They did? I think they did. Yeah. We just, we want. Yeah, we, we want, want you, you to see it. We want you to see because it's, it's such a privilege. It's such a privilege for us to be And we want here. you to notice, I don't know if you're noticing that it's not a huge palazzo. It's a, it's a small, intimate space, and that's 
what for me makes it so fascinating that there's so much art in such a small, it's yes. almost like a horror vacui of uh, Baroque art, but it, but it works. It really works. Yeah. So let's go right. into the next room. Just really quickly, this one. What? But just these two. No? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, here we're in what is known as the Chamber of the Angels. And it's got that name because if you look up at the ceiling, you see frescoes of angels playing instruments and celebrating. And then in that beautiful cupola at the top, you see the decoration, which is stucco work, gold tesserae, and mother of pearl. It's really elaborate. It's like a little jewel box. And at the top of it, you see a fresco of the archangel Michael, who of course was the patron saint of Michelangelo and the Buonarroti family. And so there, this is the most religious room, uh, the most uh, full of Christian symbolism. There, there are very and the altar. Uh, a whole series of frescoes of the church triumphant on the walls, and and the, over, and the um, altar. Right? And over here, on uh, over here, <laughs> we have the altar, which this this was actually used as a family chapel from the late 1600s until the Buonarroti family gave it to the city of Florence. And so this is a beautiful inlaid wood um, piece designed by Pietro da Cortona, and then the altar. And then down here we have a relic of St. Agnes. Mm -hmm. So this was a, a very sacred space, really. And um, it's, it's a beautiful ensemble and it's complete. That's another thing about we're so lucky to have this series of rooms the way that they were designed. And we even have the drawings for them. So it's a, it's a whole complete piece. Yeah, it, you're really, we're really inside of a jewel box. You feel yeah. like this is what it feels like <laughs> <laughs> to be inside. Um, do you okay, let's go on yeah. into the next room, which is really my favorite. Yes, this is a, this is a hidden treasure. I've also done quite a bit of conservation work in this room, so I'm, I'm particularly fond of it. And it's uh, known as the studio, the study. Do you want to tell yes. us a little bit about it? Yes, this is, this is a privilege to be here with you. Um, <laughs> this is the room of the illustrious Tuscans. So <laughs> some of you on your lunch hour with the illustrious Tuscans, um, great minds, philosophers, theologians, navigators, uh, poets from, from the region. And it's basically a republic of intelligence and wisdom. And, and what, what this was conceived as, and this is what Michelangelo the Younger was doing in his little study. Yeah. Right? He had a little study for big ideas. That's right. Because they, here at the, at the archives, they have his sketches. And you can see the relationships that he forms in his sketches of all of these different um, characters, and who who span a time span from from, from ancient times, ancient all yeah. the way to his to modern, contemporaries of Michelangelo the Younger's. Exactly. But what was this room used for? Are you going to tell us about yeah. that? Yeah. Well, uh, well, first I want to say okay. that we're actually inside of a painting. Before we yeah. were inside of a jewel box, now we're inside of a painting because. This was conceived as a three-dimensional school of Athens. So the school of Athens in Rome with all of the intelligentsia of, of, the, of the world, essentially. Right. And so here we are as thinkers. Liz, come closer to the table with me. Here we are with, as, as thinkers. And along the walls, you can see, um, and are you catching the walls? Along well, the walls, just in back of you as well. All, yeah. all the four okay. walls are Were covered with cabinets, right? And the volumes of Michelangelo, of Michelangelo, the great drawings, the ones that he didn't burn, right? Because That's Michelangelo right. <laughs> was famous for burning his drawings when he felt that they didn't achieve a level of perfection. So what Michelangelo the Younger wanted to actually do was create a room where scholars of his great uncle and scholars in general, enlightened scholars, could come and study and discuss the works. And so if you look at 
the frescoes, you see that all of the figures are actually in conversation. And so it was a way for modern day uh, individuals to participate in history. I just want to yeah, and if you, yeah. if you look around the room also, you see that all of them have got papers and books they're on. It's, a, it's a, an illusionistic loggia of a villa. Yes. And they're all leaning on this wonderful balustrade. It's, it's just, if we want to look, for example, at the wall of poets and writers, um, they're separated by genre. So you have the heroic writers, the classic writers, the burlesque, the tragic etc. And we just wanted to point out three greats. Okay. Um, we have Petrarch, for example, who's sitting on the ledge in the very corner and he's pointing Looking out at us. To his, <laughs> yes, he's, he's waving. No, but he's pointing right. to a bust of Plato um, that you'll see up there. And then we have Boccaccio right in the center, another very famous uh, Tuscan poet, the author of the Decameron. And I dare you all to know who this, this supreme guy over in poet, the corner looking kind of disgruntled with yeah. his elbow on his face. But yeah. the supreme poet, the father of the Italian language, Dante Alighieri. Um, so this is an example of the poets and writers. And then Liz, did you want to take us to the yeah. navigators? And okay, over yeah. here on this window wall, we have a more scientific group of people. And in this corner, we have navigators and physicists. And you can see right here, leaning on the ledge, this wonderful portrait of Galileo. What is remarkable about this, and we know this from looking at sketches that Michelangelo was working on, he put Galileo in, he took him out, he put him back in, in the, in the workups to the frescoes. Because during this time, Galileo was actually on trial for heresy, and he finally decided to put him in the fresco. Do you, have, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, it was, it was a moment. He had just um, basically been sentenced. Right. He'd gone through his trial. He'd been sentenced. He was on, he was on exile um, here in Tuscany. And so what Michelangelo... Just outside Florence, yeah, right? Um, but what Michelangelo did by putting him here was to basically vouch for his science. Absolutely. And we have to remember that, that Galileo was the Medici's teacher. And so um, what's interesting is even Michelangelo the Younger, who was a poet, he was an incredible playwright and poet. And one of his poems, um, he, he includes the phrase, io so che il mondo è tondo, which means, I know the world is round. That's right. Um, but it, it's, it's incredible, and I, I, I want to just also recall the connection with Artemisia here as well. Mm -hmm. Because um, if you think of this young woman you know, who wasn't educated in no. a classic way, who suddenly found herself among the greatest thinkers of the time, but she corresponded with well, Galileo. For her, for her whole life, yes. she was writing back and forth yeah. with Galileo. Mm -hmm. She so, called both of them godfather, both yeah. Michelangelo That's younger, wonderful. And, and Galileo. So it's, it's, it's quite moving. Um, and no, then, it's very moving. And we would have cardinals and various religious personalities visiting this place and seeing the man that they condemned on the wall. So, I mean, it was, it was brave of Michelangelo the Younger to put Galileo, his friend, up there. And I'm so glad that he did. Yeah. And behind him, there are various other personalities. I just wanted to point out the guy with the, in the white holding the map there is Amerigo Vespucci, who of course gave the continent of the Americas his name because he was a wonderful map maker and uh, put us on the map, so to speak. Yes. So, yes. so what about where are the women <laughs> in this room? Well, honestly, that's why we wanted to basically end our discussion or the, 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 the walking part of our discussion, let's say, um, in this room because it does inspire the question, where are the women? And we'll remember that where are the women is actually what inspired Advancing Women Artists. It's a question that has led all of our, proje all of our projects Absolutely. over the years. And um, slowly but surely, you know, women are beginning to be recognized. And we, we do have, um, if you, if you just want to look at the, Francisco, if you would look at the ceiling 
Um, here we have a representation of history. And she is an allegory, a female allegory, obviously. She has this wonderful peasant's face. It's the, pa the face of a Tuscan peasant that in some way is in juxtaposition with her role, this very serious role. She's also sometimes um, thought of as fame. That's right. I prefer to think well, of her the, as history. You know, the, there was a really a fraught um, relationship between this painter who was Cecco Bravo, who had a mind of his own, yes. and Michelangelo, the younger, the micromanager. Yeah. And maybe part of the problems that we were having was that this figure was never really the attributes of fame or the attributes of history are not quite right. Mm. And so there's a little bit of confusion. Mm. But I just think it's such a wonderful image with um, all of these cupids around her and then the balcony. It's kind of like the Camera di Sposi yes. of Montaigne. And the and same colors, too. Yeah. The same color. yeah. And she has a, a, a pen that has a, a flame, essentially, the light of knowledge. Right. And um, the olive and the branch, branch yeah. rather than the trumpet. So That's right. This, this throwback also to um, Athena, the goddess of wisdom. And we see very and they, small and there frescoes. are the four crowns. You see the four crowns that are being held up of poetry, sculpture, architecture, and painting. So that brings us back to the divinization of Michelangelo in the first room. So really yeah. maybe history brings you fame. Mm -hmm. So, you know. well, I think, I think that this figure history was she who inspires virtue. Mm -hmm. And one thing when we were, when we were taking a walk through the museum, um, with Elena Lombardi, um, one of the wonderful. main fixtures yeah. of, of um, Casa Buonarroti, a wonderful um, storyteller too. Along with Dr. Cecchi, uh, Along with course. Dr. Cecchi, yes. She was, she was telling us that um, Michelangelo the Younger was one of the first to recognize the importance of his relationship with Michelangelo, to establish himself and affirm himself as a, de as a descendant of Michelangelo. And that is something that I want to to tell you about it, you know, to tell the audience about because I think in the work that we do and, and the work that we do, I'm including everybody in this because it is the job of all of us to recognize and remember the achievements of our ancestors and of women, particularly um, within the context of art by women. Um, but that idea of, of recognizing the, the bond, recognizing and valuing the bond. And so what Michelangelo the Younger did was create this amazing testimony to, to his great uncle's contributions, right? And so there's a piece of Artemisia there and, and many other artists as well um, that we've mentioned, but I think that's a, a closing thought that we can... Well, it's also the perfect closing thought for AWA because, I mean, what have we done? We've, we've created the bond. Yeah. And this bond is going to continue. Yes, <laughs> yes. It really is. So. Okay. I, I think we're done so, with our visit, and yeah. so we're going to go back to the gallery now. Yep. Yeah. And we'll have questions. Yep. Yeah. So we are going to go back through the rooms right. um, quickly, and we will be happy to um, speak with the audience and we're hoping, right Liz, we're hoping that some people will have added a value or a virtue that they think is um, <laughs> appropriate for Artemisia. Exactly, that, that, that sort of exemplifies her life. Um, it would be interesting to see what you have to say from that point of view. So yeah. we're asking you questions too. Not only <laughs> um, are we getting asked. And we we want to hear from you. Yeah. All right, uh, Linda, Litz, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much again uh, to the both of you for uh, your uh, presentation and for guiding us through uh, the rooms of the Museo uh, Casa Buonarroti in the Florence. And also I would like to say once again, grazie mille to the president of the museo, Cristina Cidini, for uh, keeping the museum open for us and for having us uh, with uh, you uh, tonight. Uh, I also would like to say a big grazie to the technical crew who was there uh, 
uh, with you in Florence, uh, moving in such uh, uh, an intimate space and uh, try to display this beautiful work of art at uh, their best, it's uh, not easy, especially when you also have to follow all the uh, safety protocols in place this day. So um, thank you so much uh, to uh, Francesco and the rest uh, of the crew uh, there. So in the interest of time, I'm uh, going to start reading immediately a few uh, questions uh, for uh, uh, you. And uh, I will start uh, with one, actually two questions. Uh, I'm going to combine the question by Victoria and the other one by John, who are asking specifically about uh, um, the inclination by uh, Artemisia and if there is uh, any symbolism um, in the uh, object, the vase looking object that Artemisia has uh, in her hand and uh, also uh, in the star, the star that you can see, I believe, uh, on the uh, right, uh, uh, just next to uh, the woman's face. Well, we can both answer that together. That it's not a vase; it is a compass, and it's the sort of compass that you might have seen on a boat, actually. So it has a it has a bowl, and then the compass magnetic part is floating on the top and she's you, you probably couldn't see that through the uh, camera but she's holding it up and it does sort of look like a vase but it's actually a compass and it's inclined so she's giving a nod to the whole mathematical definition of inclination as an inclined plane and it's also the compass that is guiding her life really the polar star yeah. That's the polar star because that's where the compass points usually. Right. right. So the, it's the north star above her head. And and I think it's it's important too. I mean, the the science of cosmology and the and the idea of astronomy and astrology because we have to remember that Galileo also created the astrological maps of the Grand Dukes. That's for right. Example. So in this period, it was it was very important to to look at the stars and you had your guiding star and your, your celestial map, each, each individual. I mean, even the, the name Cosimo comes from Cosmo, Cosmos. Um, so, so, you know, inclination, having the, the um, inspiration, you know, to, to create great works. Christina, did you want to add anything? Oh, yes, I think it's a, it's a meaning that is positive, it's a good inclination. Mm -hmm. So it leads uh, the artist towards his uh, career and masterpieces and successes. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, um, I'm uh, just also going through uh, the comments, uh, uh, replying to your question about uh, adjectives that could depict uh, Artemisia. And uh, uh, many people are saying uh, courage, strength, uh, perseverance, um, fortitude. Uh, many beautiful uh, words, uh, I have to say. And uh, also many, uh, many of our um, viewers are asking if you would recommend uh, any uh, books uh, to read about uh, Artemisia and learn more about her heart. We'll each have one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wanted to suggest um, the, the catalog, the exhibition catalog um, for the show that was just done, Artemisia, curated by um, Letizia Treves at the National Gallery, which, which really brings together so many um, interesting international scholars and really groundbreaking research, um, the product of incredible study in recent years. And um, it, it really brings together so many, so many people who have dedicated their lives to Artemisia um, and her achievements. So I would choose that. Really a 360 view yeah. of her. I would suggest uh, to reread probably a rather old book by Anna Banti, mm -hmm. wife of the great, the great uh, art historian Roberto, Roberto Longhi. Longhi. And she, uh, as a superb writer, she uh, reinvented the life of Artemisia through the documents and the evidences, but also putting sent feelings and, uh, and stories in, in her incredible life. Mm -hmm. So it's a great book, really. Anna Banti. Anna Banti. Anna Banti. Well, 
Well, I can't and, top and, and I can't top also. the two of you, so I'm I'm just <laughs> going to let it go there. But there there is another uh, much more frivolous book called The Passion of Artemisia, which mm-hmm. which I'm I'm quite fond of that book. It's a, it's a romanticized version of her life. Mm-hmm. But do you remember who the author no. is? No, Alessandra Lapierre. It could be. It could be. Mm. Yeah. There, there are quite a few books about. I mean, you, there's a lot of meat on yeah. Artemisia. So. Yeah. Thank you. Taking notes of all uh, your uh, suggestions, and uh, uh, now I'm going uh, to a question about uh, uh, Artemisia's. Uh, personal uh, life. Um, we know that uh, she was trained by, by uh, her father and uh, uh, Barbara is also uh, asking uh, if she was married and mainly uh, if uh, her marriage was uh, successful and now she managed and uh, balanced the expectations that society would have had uh, for her at uh, uh, that time with uh, her being also uh, a successful artist. It's a great question, and it's <laughs> it merits another hour <laughs> of lecture. <laughs> Artemisia's relationships were, were quite complex. Um, she married Pier Antonio Statesi, um, and it, you know, I, I was I'm remembering the the story that we talked about before of Artemisia on horseback and her fleeing Florence. Fleeing Florence, she was, um, you know, she had a, 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 a lover recently discovered, her love letters were recently discovered, um, uh, Marenghi, you know, her love, mm-hmm. and he was a, an emissary of the, um, uh, I'm blanking out on the name of the family. The Frescobaldi family, yes. I have someone in the wings helping. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie's in the wings helping, thank goodness. Uh, the Frescobaldi family. And um, this, this lover, well, her husband actually helped Artemisia um, exploit her lover economically. So it, it was quite it was an a complex situation. complex situation. But let's say there, were, there was also the fact that her husband was a painter. And he was not as successful as she was. So, you know, also all kinds of uh, complications there, I'm sure. And they did have, I mean, she had uh, how many children? Four or five children, some of whom passed away. I think so all the, all the personal one. life was, was very complicated. Mm-hmm. Christina. But she persevered. Perseverance and courage are de- definitely two attributes that I would put in her temple. Yeah. What would you like to say about... Artemisia's personal life. Well, uh, it sounds like that sometimes, sometimes. Um, reflects on her, the interpretation of her art, yeah. uh, maybe a bit too much. Right. <laughs> She's a good painter independently from her personal life, I think. Yeah, yeah. that's often true with women artists. You know, yeah. There's, there's, a, there's lot a lot of, of identification, identification with. with mm-hmm. Mm-hmm with their stories, with their personalities, um, because it's important to understand their context too, you know, to understand why they were producing in a certain way, what they were producing, etc. So I think that's, that could be seen across the board, really, um, much more so than with male artists, I would say. Well, you don't ask a male artist, how are you managing your family and your career? You just, you know. <laughs> yeah. Take it for granted. Yeah. Right. Somebody's managing it for you if you can. So. Yeah. Right. And uh, uh, talking about uh, connections, uh, I would like to uh, read a question that we got from uh, uh, Elizabeth, who is asking about uh, um, Artemisia and uh, if she was uh, connected with other uh, women artists working uh, um, at the same time when she was uh, alive, and uh, also uh, about uh, her legacy and uh, the influence that uh, she had on the uh, many women artists who in the future uh, uh, took inspiration uh, from uh, her. There was a, a wonderful article recently by Mary Garrard on, on the a comparative, a comparative study between Artemisia and uh, Giovanna Garzoni and the differences that exist in their art, but how you know each in their own way and in very different styles, um, you know had a had a, had a, a 
well, different experiences, but I, I definitely recommend an article like that one. I know Artemisia was was um, very interested in emulating someone like Lavinia Fontana, who you know was extremely successful as a professional artist. She got some of the the first public commissions granted to a female artist, and that was her her um, model. Okay. And, she, and Artemisia, when she got to Naples, she finally got her first public commissions in churches there. Mm -hmm. I know that she taught her daughter to paint, her daughter Prudence, Prudentia. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think, I think she was making those connections. Mm -hmm. You want to add, you. Christina, where I was make you, make you <laughs> no, take away the last one. Women artists at the time, especially... Yeah. In Florence, and uh, so probably she was a bit isolated from, yeah. uh, from a general point of view. Yeah. Okay, I think we have uh, uh, time for uh, one last uh, um, question, and uh, I would like to take this uh, uh, question from uh, Leslie, which is uh, very uh, interesting, and also I think it gives us a nice way uh, to uh, wrap up uh, this uh, presentation. Leslie is asking uh, why Artemisia often use herself as a, a model, and she's also suggesting that this might be because as a woman she had access to her body, but she's also saying that this could be a way to uh, immortalize herself and uh, from uh, an external point of view uh, I'm not an expert on this uh, uh, subject but I, I would totally agree with her because uh, what uh, Artemisia did uh, in this uh, uh, painting uh, the, the inclination that we have just uh, seen is, is quite unique she is representing uh, Michelangelo's uh, uh, virtue by um, making a self-portrait. So it's indeed a great uh, uh, sign uh, of authorship, uh, a sign that she was aware of uh, uh, her ability and uh, uh, a sign that maybe she uh, taught herself, uh, you know, at the same level of Michelangelo. That's exactly right. I mean, yeah. she's, she's creating a connection between herself and Michelangelo the Great. Um, and, I mean, essentially, it was marketing. You know, it was, it was a way to, to present her face to the world. And also, it was a privileged position. Because in a, in a situation where there weren't, you know, hundreds of female artists working yeah. in a certain court, for example, um, Commissioners found that very attractive to to have uh, both maker and muse, you know, someone who could be in the canvas and be also creating the canvas. And she often would um, choose heroines, whether it was Cleopatra or Lucrezia or um, Judith. Know, Judith. There was always something reminiscent of of Artemisia's face, you know, I, even idealized. Even beginning with, with, with one of her first portraits, the, the martyred saint, which, you know, she turns the self-portrait into a Saint Catherine. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe in the beginning she was really not having access to other faces, but I, I think it then became a trademark of hers. Mm -hmm. well, the self-portrait of an artist was becoming a very fashionable uh, yes. way of, of painting uh, uh, portraits. And, uh, and I think it was for from Artemisia, a strong um, statement that she was as important as a male painter. Mm. Tell us, Florence has so many self-portraits oh, yes. by women. It's thanks to the one of the Medici family, Cardinal Leopoldo, who started two collections, two remarkable collections, a collection of, a collection of drawings that it's still uh, a, a landmark in this kind of work of art, and the collection of self-portraits. Mm. He started asking the art, living artists uh, and buying on the market the old ones. Yes. And so it, it was a genial idea. Mm -hmm. that is so, <laughs> so good that still the collection is open and it can acquire and incorporate uh, contemporary artists yeah. for self-portraits. Right. And we also dedicated, do remember that, I think, uh, an exhibition on the women self-portraits. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. 2009, yeah. uh -huh. 
the outer retract. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. A wonderful exhibit. Yeah. Not far away. No. It was, it was, it was here, and nearby. It was so close. Mm-hmm. Well, everything's close in Florence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what do you think, so, Manuela? Are we... Oh, I think uh, it was uh, brilliant. So thank you so much again, uh, Linda and uh, Liz, for uh, your time and for guiding us uh, through the museum and uh, uh, through the rooms of uh, Casa Bonarroti. And uh, again, my deepest gratitude also goes uh, to Cristina Acidini for uh, uh, having us in uh, Museo Casa Bonarroti uh, tonight. Um, well, your night, our uh, afternoon. And uh, I also would like to say grazie uh, to the uh, technical crew in Florence as I was mentioning at the very beginning of this uh, program, this uh, uh, was the first time that we tried uh, uh, doing something like this uh, using uh, uh, live cameras instead of uh, um, using uh, uh, a slideshow, uh, a screen share uh, on Zoom. And uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, it took uh, uh, three women for us to do so. <laughs> <laughs> so. Again, uh, grazie uh, mille everyone and I would like to take this opportunity to remind our audience that uh, uh, the rest of our programs uh, during this month uh, will also be devoted uh, to uh, women and the role of women uh, in Italian history. We'll uh, have programs uh, on music, uh, cinema, uh, literature. We'll talk about uh, Grazia Deledda, who was the uh, first and only Italian uh, woman to win the Nobel Prize uh, for uh, uh, literature. Please uh, stay in touch with us, follow us on our social media to learn how to join us for uh, uh, these uh, events. Again, grazie mille, uh, Linda, thank you so much, uh, Liz, and uh, grazie, uh, really, uh, our deepest gratitude goes to uh, Cristina Cidini and Museo of Casa Buonarroti. I couldn't have imagined a better way uh, to spend uh, International Women's Day, and uh, also, again, uh, Buona Festa della Donna, Happy Women's Day to all of you and to all the women in the audience. Alla prossima, arrivederci. Likewise, thank you, thank thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.